There we go. Hey guys, wait for a few minutes for a few people to hopefully show up. Welcome. Let me know how everybody can hear me. First time getting all set up in here, so we're getting a little used to it. I got my beer. Hopefully I know when people are live. Hey, cool, one guy's here. You can go ahead and introduce yourself or write something over in the comments if you guys want here to get started so I know who's here and can help answer any questions you guys have. We're going here in just a few minutes. This is all new for me, so how's everyone doing this evening? There we go, now we got a few people. Hello, welcome to the live version of the Cast in the Hatch. I'm gonna try it out here tonight. Hope everyone's got a drink, and hope everyone's got, uh... hey, what's up, Matt? Good to see you, man. Um, yeah, new place is sweet. This is the uh, headquarters back here. We've got a nice, nice big office. We've got a couch just for the dogs so they can hang out. And uh, yeah, lots of room. Still putting in some furniture and getting the storage and everything all set up, but it's really nice. How you been? Yes, I know. It would have been better if I was here in Montana. I almost moved to Montana because I was wondering uh, real close. But then my wife got pregnant with a third kid on the way. So now we're uh, going to stick here in Golden, Colorado is where we're at now. And we're going to keep fishing here in Colorado for a little while longer and keep doing some stuff with the catch and the hatch here. All right, let me see. Let me pull up the River Explorer. It's a couple of those going to do today. So today what I was going to kind of go over for those of you who are here, um, can everyone hear me okay? Just shoot a quick like over or do like a little love comment or whatever those little things are. If you guys can hear me okay, if there's any problems visu you know, with my with video or anything like that, let me know. Hey, Tucker. Oh, only one hookup. But hey, dude, at least you're fishing all day doing streamers. That's a good thing. All right, there we go. We got a couple of happies, one sad. I think that's sad for Matt Thompson because I'm still not moving to Montana. It's it's not in the cards. My cousin Spencer just moved up there, though. You got to go check him out. Uh, he's going up to uh, uh, MSU up there. So uh, he's fishing like constantly. My cousin's up there this weekend, so you should hit him up and see if you guys can go fishing. Woo, Matt Thompson's also having another kid. Very nice. Congrats, Matt. That's awesome, buddy. Super excited for you. What's up, Daryl? How you doing, man? Family game out and me. Do I get to play in the games as well? That'd be cool. It's a little weird. It's like you guys get to hear me talk, and then you guys comment a few minutes later, so I don't know if what I say is actually funny or if it's, like, not funny at all. I guess I just need to, you know, wait for the likes or the ha-has to come across or something. It's very interesting. But anyway, this would be a good time to talk. So anyway, real quick, a couple of things I was going to do and talk with you guys tonight about was a few things that I was learning just recently on some tight lining techniques that I've learned on some tailwaters here in Colorado. Um, that's some of the stuff I was going to talk about tonight. I'm going to show you guys the new uh, Predator streamer fly box from Tacky. This thing is ginormous, as you can see. I feel like a very small dwarf or something like that while I hold this box. Um, the thing is absolutely massive. Holds up to 72 flies, apparently, written here on the back. Um, it's got all the you know magnetic closures, just like uh, all tacky boxes have, the, si the silicone inserts. It's got these little plastic pieces, if you can see kind of right in here, for like your like articulated streamers. You can set it right up in, in here so it kind of holds them in place, because all the streamer boxes that I have, even ones that are kind of meant for streamers, totally get in the way. Those, the, the articulated streamers just fall around everywhere and make a mess out of everything, knock the other streamers loose. There's big bullies in the fly box. They're no fun at all. Um, but they're a lot of fun to fish, so I like carrying them. Um, so I've just been using like some tacky originals and then I threw in their dry fly box seems to work okay for uh, a lot of streamers for me. But this one here, I mean, the, the slits are straight through all the way, so you can put it anywhere you need to. Um, they're a lot of those like cliff bugger boxes, but um, ironically a little bit smaller than that even. Um, but, I mean, either way you look at it, man, like, I don't see how you put this thing, you take this thing with you aside from putting, like, in your backpack or maybe something like that. So, um, anyway, it's pretty cool, but uh, I'm not 
I'm going to take it out of the actual packaging here and, and try it out here to see how I actually feel about it on the river here soon. But now's the time of time to be doing it. So, um, let's see some of the comments here. You guys go ahead. Um, along the way, you guys go and just post a few questions if you have stuff. So in, in my group lately, I've been doing a lot of uh, Q&A. So as uh, Facebook introduced something new recently that when you sign up for my group, I can ask you a couple questions. One is if you've purchased from the catch in the hatch or not, and just so I kind of know if your customers or not customers help you with the marketing and stuff. Um, the second one is what's your biggest struggle in fly fishing? And I want you guys to kind of just kind of post up some questions, and you guys have been, you know, putting up a lot of things saying, hey, my biggest problems is, you know, I don't know what flies to be using on the river. I don't know how to match the hatch. Um, you know, I want to get better at nymphing. Uh, I don't know how to catch bass on the fly. All sorts of questions all over the place. It's really cool. Um, and I've been trying to just, I'm screenshotting all of those and I'm writing them all down and I'm keeping track of them to kind of slowly answer them over the next, you know, few weeks. And, you know, a lot of you guys have the same questions and I'm kind of pulling them all together. Things that get enough interest that I don't already have content written on, I'll make sure to write content for those as well. Just to help answer your questions because that's what we're here to do is just help you guys catch fish and find adventures and learn how to fly fish better. So, um, let's see. I guess if you guys have any questions, you guys can want to post them over here in the comments for now. Um, other than that, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, things that I've been learning just recently. Um, even though I, you know, teach online for fly fishing, I'm still learning tons of things. I mean, I've been getting, no, there's not a person out there who said that they've got it figured out. Um, there's some places where I feel like I probably got it figured out pretty good on those rivers, but I go to other rivers and, and I just get schooled. And I just got to, you know, reteach myself all sorts of different things. The techniques that I've used on other rivers don't work here. Um, so the more techniques you can learn, uh, the more variety of flies and understanding when to use them and why to use them um, and kind of understanding a framework on how to um, catch fish more so than just tips on catching fish. Like when you're in the situation, go and do this, that's a tip. A framework is say, okay, let's learn why in the first place you need to even adjust that technique or that style or that fly in order to catch that fish and why that was successful over the others. Once you kind of learn um, the real framework of fly fishing and then catching more fish, which is why we focus all of our content around fly selection, um, proper location on the river, everything from reading the water all the way to being on the right river, uh, the right weather, all of that stuff, and then presentation, everything from dry fly, nymphing, uh, different nymphing techniques and things like that, uh, which of course leads me to um, these nymphing techniques that I've been learning lately. Um, for about the last three years or so, I've been doing uh, tight line nymphine, modern nymphine, neuro nymphine, Czech nymphine, Polish nymphine. There's variances in all of them, but pretty much what you're talking about is fishing without a strike indicator, typically with longer leader, longer rods, um, in hopes that um, you know it can improve the presentation and the drift of your nymphs throughout the water. You can hit different places. Um, there's a lot of different benefits to having that. Um, and so I've been I've been fishing tailwaters a lot. I mean, we've got a lot of tailwaters here in Colorado. I'm born and raised in Colorado, but places like uh, Decker's, uh, Cheeseman Canyon, the Blue, uh, right below you know um, uh, in, in in town there in Silverthorne, um, the Taylor, um, and then where I was at on the stagecoach of uh, uh, the stagecoach section of, of, of the Yampa River, um, all these places, man, these fish see so much pressure, and they you can just like walk right up on them. Um, at the end of the day, I got bored. I caught a few fish and was kind of hanging out, drinking a beer. And I uh, was able to actually, you know, seen up some scuds. And I was throwing the scuds into the water. And these fish would just come right over within feet of me and just eat the scuds. So it was like I was literally like feeding them like it was some sort of petting zoo. And that's just the type of fish that exist in these specific types of tailwaters that, you know, they're all catch and release. Um, there's good sized numbers. These fish have seen a lot of anglers. They get pressured almost 24-7. Um, it's just a whole different environment. Um, so that's kind of the, um, you know, that, that's kind of what you're looking at when you're, when you're fishing on these tailwaters. And so what I've had to do is adapt some of my, my common techniques. You know, a, a lot of people fish a, a strike indicator, some split shot and a couple flies under it, and they just kind of hope for the best. They just keep hammering these fish, and eventually you'll get a few that eat. Um, but these fish are eating constantly and there are ways that we catch them, you know, close to constantly if they're actually actively on the feed. Um, you just have to match the right fly. And uh, the biggest thing that I learned over this was, you know, you definitely have to have that because if you don't match the right fly, it doesn't matter what your presentation is doing. Those, those fish just aren't keyed in. They're, they're very keyed in on specific patterns. But um, the, the, the presentation in which I approached it, 
Um, the biggest thing that I was screwing up was that I've had too much weight on. Um, let me grab my fly box here real quick. Let me just show you a couple of these. These flies here, these are a lot of what I use. And what I use here, I'll see if I can get it close enough so you guys can see it. But I use some, uh, it's like a size 14 here. Let's see if I can get that nice and close. You can kind of see, it's not great. Um, a size 14 um, jig style nymph. This is a little, just a little Euro type of Frenchy variation that I've got, right? These are like my bread and butter these days. I've just been using these a lot. And they work really well in a lot of places. But that's like a 2.8 millimeter bead. And when these fish were sitting over feeding in, you know, two, maybe three feet of water max, um, and they're up more toward the surface, it just wasn't working. Um, these fish, they, they could just see it coming, and you could see them move right out of, out of where your drift would come down. And then as it went past, they just move right back in. And they just, they just knew there's nothing I could do about it. So I didn't, I changed flies a dozen times, and that didn't work, and uh, switched up to different, you know, all sorts of different patterns, and went to 6X and 7X, and none of that worked. So uh, all of that was just not working. By the way, check out this butt. Check out this mug. Isn't this thing awesome? Big shout out to Brett Johnson. He's not on Facebook, but this guy got me this mug for his uh, groomsman for a groomsman gift when I was in his wedding. Had a lot of beers over the years. Very nice. Um, so what I found was that as soon as I switched up to a lighter pattern, of course being in shallower water, but a lighter pattern along with that 6X, not using a strike indicator, not using split shot, um, these fish would eat it one out of three casts. I mean, it was, it was money. And I was fishing small midges and scuds and the same sort of stuff that probably all of us are fishing on, on rivers, but with less, um, with less weight, it just, it produced so much better for me. And it just kind of reopening. I, I talk on my side a lot about using more weight, making sure you're getting down to the bottom where the fish are at. Cause a lot of people fish faster water and they, they always, you know, are not fishing enough weight. And so the fish just never even see your flies and you just miss fish. And a lot of people, especially when you're fishing with a strike indicator, you've got to get it down fast. You have to sacrifice that presentation to get it down faster because you get that strike indicator that's going to drag along the top of the surface. So, but with a tight line technique, you're not getting that drag. So you can just slow it down, especially in that nice slow water. You can drag it just, and you can just let it drift down, you know, just inch at a time right on their nose. And if it's a soft presentation, not very much weight, it just kind of sits there and suspends. And I, I mean, you're, you, you know, we're sight fishing, sight fishing these fish and you can just see them just look at it, engage with it instead of move out of the way like the ones were before. And then they just eat it and you just set the hook on them. And it was, it was pretty easy at that point. It really was. It, it, it made, it made what seems like always those tricky tailwaters where at least me, I've always kind of struggled. Um, it's always been a harder place for me to catch fish than, you know, places that are less pressured, you know, freestone waters. Um, it just changed it all around for me. Um, so what happened after that is it started rising to dries. Um, I don't know if anyone else had this experience too. I mean, and, and, and am I just the only one who's, who's found that less weight on some of these tailwaters can really help produce a lot, uh, a lot more fish. Um, go ahead and comment below and, and tell me if you guys have seen, you know, different tips and things like that as well. Um, hold on. We got a quick question here. Did you hold that mug out away from you to make it look bigger? No, I did not. Uh, Larry, it is as big as it looks. Um, this is now right up against me. Here's my little side profile here. It's as big as it looks. I don't, I don't know. It's like 20 something, 20 something ounces, you know, like in the, uh, the Hobbit or Lord of the Rings or something, when they find out that you can have pints and it's kind of like the man size adult version of that. Terry, you're saying you guys also see that on, on the tailwater in the yard. That's a, that's a good spot that I'll have to try a lot. Um, I almost always fish the, the, the deeper runs, uh, down there and, and, and the, uh, in, in, in the, in the Pueblo stretch. And I do good fishing squirmy worms and things like that, but all of them, again, big, heavy tungsten beads and I'm getting down and just kind of dragging that bottom and I can produce a lot of fish that way. But, um, there's some times where they're up in those shallows and when they're in those shallows, I mean, of course it makes sense to change your weight. Uh, but I think a lot of times we just get lazy as anglers or we just get used to the confidence that a certain pattern brings. I know I get very confident in a certain size of bead head because I know how it's going to drift. I know how it's going to present. Um, I can feel the strikes a lot better. When The less weight I get on my line, the more I'm moving it up and down, trying to feel the fish because I can't feel the weight. And it just kind of throws me throws me up a little bit. Um, yeah, tungsten putty is also um, also a really good op uh, option. Uh, good call on that, Justin. Because um, it is. You can just take little pieces of it and just kind of slide it on. I personally don't use it, um, probably just because I've never bought it. And But it is good. And I know it works really well. 
I had a lot of people who talk about that too. So, um, so all, all that being said is, you know, less weight, I think is, is, is the takeaway there for, for tailwaters when they're in shallower water. Um, you'll see, you know, there's usually a main run that it's coming through and then they're sitting off in that side water right there. And that side water is typically, you know, it's just, it's be stocked full of fish and that's where those, uh, you know, those fish are staging up to be rising or they're waiting for something to happen or they are kind of occasionally rising. This is what happened later on in this. And, um, you know, just lighter, lighter, you know, lighter and smaller worked a whole lot better. And then again, having it be tight lining, not having a strike indicator. These didn't need it in that water. And you can see the fish. You can see when they, they ate your fly. Half times you can even see your fly drifting through the water. So you just don't need a strike indicator in that. So uh, for guys who only fish strike indicators, I encourage you to kind of maybe take that off and play with, with the balance of it. There's times where you need a strike indicator. There are times where you don't. So um, I'd recommend, you know, playing with that a little bit. Then always just adjusting and playing with your weight to match where the fish are. Um, if you're in front of fish and you know you're in front of them and they're not eating, lightening up that weight is going to improve the presentation and the way that that nymph drifts through the water. The great thing that I found after that is the fish started rising. And I was like, great. I only brought one rod on the river. And with this tight line rig, I got this like side indicator line and uh, 20 feet of mono before I even get to my fly line. I'm like, how am I going to cast a dry fly, which is mono one? And long story short, it, it, I mean, it's tough to with 25 feet of mono on. It's not tapered it's tough to throw dry flies, um, you know, any sort of a distance. But again, these fish were 10 feet from me and they weren't, you know, that upset about, you know, my presence. I mean, you could walk right up on them. You could be 10, 15 feet or less from them. And it just kind of hit me. I go, why don't I just try throwing a dry on? And then just very much like a, almost, almost Tinkara style. I mean, you're just kind of dapping at them. You can still throw, throw the rod um, a little bit and get those flies out a few feet in front of you, but not a whole lot. But what I found is that as soon as I did that, the presentation that I could get, I mean, I could, I was throwing this tiny little, uh, uh, like a sprouts, uh, midge, like a size 22. And I found that I could, I could move that fly. I could drift it up and down and move it around in the water so well that it, I mean, the, the, the presentation on it was just crazy and the fish could not resist it. It was literally the best dry fly presentation that I've ever come across. Um, I couldn't get distance. So you sacrifice distance for this amount of uh, presentation and feel but um it was awesome I, mean, I i i caught i think eight fish and 12 casts more or less um which was just you know i mean when you got back when you got those type of hookup ratios you know you're doing something right and that presentation was just it was just too hard to pass up it looks so natural even me i could just notice the difference immediately um i never even thought about trying to just throw a dry fly on a euro style you know nymphy rod um, even something as small as that, you know, throwing a big heavy bug, you know, big, you know, salmon fly or something like that, can, you know, that makes some sense, I suppose, because you can still kind of throw that. But this, it was just like there's nothing at the end of it and it just made the presentation so light. It was pretty awesome. So um, has anyone else had that experience? Anyone ever, else ever thrown a dry fly with a Euro style type of rig, you know, kind of a modern nymphing, nymphing rig? Um, so uh, post it in the comments. Let me know what your guys is. Uh, success or, uh, you know, the, the ups and downs of it were for you guys, what was good, what was bad. Um, for me, it worked out really, really well. Um, so yeah, give me, give me some thoughts on that. So again, that's, that's kind of stuff that I wanted to talk about here at least tonight was just that, um, and I just, I haven't been fishing in like three weeks. It's been miserable, um, which I know is not that bad for maybe some of you guys, but for me, I'd I like to go at least once a week if I can. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's been a while. I've been moving into this new home and all that sort of stuff. So, um, that's what I've been learning recently, though, is just going with a little less weight um, on the on the nymphing rig, especially when they're up shallow. And then don't be scared to even throw a dry fly rig on when you're doing that whole your, your own nymphing thing. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Let's go into a couple questions here. We're kind of starting to stack up over here. Um, let me go through a couple. We got Monopoly causes so many fights. Yes, it does. It's unrelated to fly fishing, but man, Monopoly is it's a brutal game. I've never lost a Monopoly. That's why I like it. Um, what else we got here? Good idea for the boat. Matt asks if we get an authentic Alan Gardner worn hat if we win. Yeah, so the hat here, um, I had a made. Um, they are pretty much like they already look a little kind of like worn. It's like an old trucker style hat. It's got the mesh in the back here. Put this out here. Legacy is the company who produced them for us. Um, really dig them. Um, I found this hat. I'm really picky about my hat. So what's nice about this hat is that it's kind of got a, uh, um, it's got a short, short brim on the inside. I got a really short head. 
Um, I've got a really small head and it's really short. So anything like those tall, like, you know, like, um, like baseball type hats, you know, your, your kind of common hat, uh, those things just don't fit. They just, those big domes just come down and push it out my ears and I look like an elf or something. It looks terrible. But these here really kind of slide over the back of your head. So they work really good for smaller heads. And then people have larger heads too. I think um, from what I've seen, I've seen, I see a lot of people have these hats. Um, this is just, I just, we just put our brand on it, but, um, these hats are very popular. And uh, these are pretty nice. Um, so I get a little you know, green underside. So you got kind of catching the hatch orange. It's got our logo right up on front, mesh on the back, so it's nice and cool. And it's just got a little snap back on the top, and then a uh, little there we go, a uh, little catching the hatch right there on the back. So um, we've sold a few of these, but we've been very selective about giving them away. So they're kind of exclusive. We're not giving them to everybody. Um, we're we're kind of waiting. We'll probably be releasing them here, you know, come Black Friday weekend. Uh, Christmas time, things like that. We'll probably push them out, but right now they've kind of been sitting in our in our inventory right now, waiting to uh, waiting to unveil themselves and selectively being given out. So I thought here, since it's the first night of me going live, I thought we'd go ahead and just give one away. Think of a question here in a little bit, and we'll do a giveaway on that. So stick around for that. Um, also, got some flies right here, a dozen of them here. A few of these are kind of custom tied by me. You got some really small. Um, you got a couple of big worm patterns, like a depth charge analyt is what I call them. Uh, they're like really heavily weighted. They get down deep. Um, a few little juju betas, um, some purple juju flashbacks, uh, big cone hits, uh, stone fly, some good good flies. Anyway, I'll be giving these away as well. So stick around for that too. The predator box is mine. Sorry, I'm going to keep that and hold on to it. So I um, just want to show you guys because it's just the one that I got. I was going to try it out. So I might sell them in the shop. We'll see. But um, uh, they're pretty expensive. They're going to... 40 or 50 bucks or something. It's pretty nuts. Um, hold the mug out. Let's see. Let's go over a couple questions here real quick. <clears throat> Where is with an indicator you would miss that sample? I believe we catch more fish sampling flies because we can feel for it on a Euro Thailand rig. Daryl, I'm not actually sure what you mean, man. If you want to give a little more clarity to that, that would help me understand what you're talking about. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, some of the benefits of a, of a Euro rig is, is, is you're constantly connected. You've got tight, you know, your tight line. It's what they call a tight line technique. Uh, Matt was talking a little bit about that, um, about how, how you can really feel your line. Um, and you can feel it bounce along the bottom, or you can feel a fish actually eat it. Um, depending on the lightness of your flies, sometimes it's, it can be a little, you know, it can be a little hard to tell what's a fish at the bottom, but um, I know not a lot of guys would say they can feel the difference on that. When you're fishing with a strike indicator, I mean, when you see a strike indicator bump and move down, you don't know whether that was a fish or whether that was bottom. So there's really no way to know. So um, that's kind of, again, a number one of, uh, uh, one of the other benefits of, uh, uh, of doing the whole modern nymphy thing. Which again, I probably do about 80% of the time now when I nymph. And then about the other 20% of the time, I uh, uh, use a strike indicator. Um, let's see. And then here you can almost feel like that you hit it. Best way to build your. So we could talk about that. Instead of an indicator using tippet with color. Yeah, uh, Michael Rosenthal. Uh, instead of an indicator, I, and he asked, Instead of a, of a strike indicator, am I using a tippet with color? And I do. I have a uh, – I want to say that Real makes it. It's, uh, it's like a bio line. It's, it's 18 inches of, like, fluorescent red and then 18 inches of fluorescent green. And it's all just 2X straight taper, um, and it comes on a spool, just like your, your normal tippet spool. <clears throat> and that just spools and, – and that just – I can just pull some of that off, and I can – I usually do about uh, – so my, my, my Euro rig, I'll share that with you guys – I use uh, the Maxima Chameleon and like a like that brown that, that comes in, and it's like fifteen pound test. And I use that for um, like my butt section, and I do about fifteen feet of that more or less because I got about a ten and a half foot rod that I use. So I want to make sure that my fly line stays in my reel because the fly line creates a lot of sag when you're when you're holding up your rod like this. There will be a decent amount of sag that gets created in your fly line, but with the mono you get a lot less of that, that sag. And when you're trying to keep a tight line, that allows you to have a lot more feel. So I trim all that back pretty much. So I don't even use the fly line unless the fish really runs and takes me off. Um, so I use about 15 feet of that. And that's like 
15 pounds. That's like close to zero X or something like that, plus or minus around there. Then I use some two X um, off of that. And I just do like a triple surgeon's knot or something like that off of that down onto uh, about about three feet of that uh, cider line, uh, which is more than what most people use. A lot of people just use just a couple, uh, you know, like maybe 36 inches of it. I do it about four times. Sometimes I get really deep and I like to have, I like to make sure that I always have that cider line sitting above the water. So for me about maybe three and a half, four feet worth of, of that cider line seems to work pretty well for me. Um, then I tie on a small little tippet ring. Um, the tippet ring's nice because, um, well, I'll explain that in a minute, but then I, so I do a tippet ring and then I do something like a four X down to my first line. I do like 18 inches, maybe there Then I do, uh, 18 inches down to my second fly, uh, five X. And then I do 18 inches down to my third fly. If I use one, uh, that's six X. Um, so that's kind of how my Euro rig usually kind of gets set up. That's usually my standard. I almost always use three flies if I can, because in Colorado you're allowed to. Um, so yeah, that's that's a lot of um, that's pretty much a setup that I use. It's two of the the big differences that I that I find that I do that a lot of other people don't do is I actually when I actually tie on a fly because I'm tapering from four x to five x and five x to six x, um, I can actually so I'll just do my normal uh, like improved clinch knot like you do, and there's usually a little loop in it, right? And most people just take that loop and they put it onto the bend of the hook, pull that tight, and then you know cinch it, and then you're done. The problem with that is that with at least for me with barbless hooks, I, I throw those hooks all the time. I don't know why, maybe just cast horribly or something. But I I lose those um, I, I I lose the, the bottom fly sometimes when they come off of that barbless. So what I actually do is I I take that loop and I put it all the way over the hook, all the way over the fly, and onto the um, leader or the tippet up above. So if it's four X, it comes down. I tie on my fly. Then I actually loop up that that next line, that 5X line and that clinch knot up onto the 4X up above where the knot's tied. And I just cinch that down and ends up coming right on next to the other um, uh, on, onto the other uh, knot that's tying onto that first fly. What's nice about that is that it actually makes it adjustable. So let's say I've got all three flies and then I decided that, that top fly is not working for me for whatever reason. All I have to do is just slide my whole rig up because it slides on my line. Um, it doesn't slide very easily, but you just kind of pull it a little bit and it slides enough. And then you can tie on a new fly on that top one without having to retie all of the bottom, which is pretty sweet. Uh, hey, what's up, Maxwell? Hey, Max, Wes, hey, he's a writer of ours. He just showed up here, guys. What's up, Max? Um, <clears throat> so that's what I do when I tie on, tie on mine because it gives me the, the ability to adjust and tie on different flies out of all three of those rigs without having to. I want to get rid of the top one and then drop the bottom one or mix and match. I, I don't have to retie everything, which is really nice. Um, so that's how I tie mine. And then the other thing I do is, of course, that tippet ring, which I know a lot of guys kind of do. Um, but um, I, I do that tippet ring pretty often. And I found that's really nice because all the night before I'm sitting around drinking beer or whatnot, I'll actually, I got a little uh, a rig holder from Smith Creek. Um, I believe who makes them. They're just they're just a little piece of foam, and you can wrap your fly rig around them. So I can pre-make my my rig. So I'll do like a San Juan worm, and then I'll do like a Frenchie, and then I'll do like a small midge. And I go, that's a good standby. Like that'll probably work anywhere, sort of a thing. I'll tie up a couple of those so that I've got them. So if I want to switch over to those, I can. Then I'll think, okay, it's um, it's October, <clears throat> you know, at least in Colorado where I'm gonna be going. You know, betas, midges, San Juan worms, eggs. Those are all gonna be on the menu very likely. Um, so I'm going to tie a few different variations of those flies and those rigs and have them preset all the way up on my um, all the way up on my rig holder. And so then when I'm done, all I got to do is unravel that, um, pull that off over here, t break off right where the tippet ring is, tie all that back, you know, tie that back up on my rig holder. All those three flies that just broke off, and then I take the the other rig that I just had, tie it onto my tippet ring, and I'm done. I just switched three flies with one knot which saves me a ton of time on the river or if I'm walking up and I need a lighter rig or a heavier rig because I'm going from a deeper hole to shallower water. It's just, it's one, one quick change. I've changed up my whole rig, which is, you know, maybe 60 seconds is all it takes me, which is really nice. So I switch up a lot more uh, flies because of that, because it's just way easier. A lot of times we get lazy, right? Because you've, you know, you just spent like the last 30 minutes tying on split shot, your strike indicator and making sure everything's perfect. And then you're scared you're going to get hung up. And then if you just take the time to, have to switch up all of that, because you move to shallower water, most people just skip the shallower water and then you miss out on, you know, fish opportunity. So yeah, good job, Matt. Uh, Smith Creek streamer. Nope, that's not it actually. Nope. Let me take a look here. Close. 
but that's not actually, I don't think that's it. No, that is it. I call it streamer fly patch. But that's exactly it, actually. So I was totally wrong. Uh, looks like Cabela's has it, or Bass Pro, same thing now, right? Uh, has it on sale for 10 bucks. So pick up one of those if you guys want. Um, they're really nice. Um, really helps because, I mean, we all are out there with fish, right? We don't want to have to retie flies constantly. Um, it's a part of it, but uh, as much as me as we can minimize that or or prepare doing it the night before, right? When we're not fishing, you might as well sit around. You're all thinking about fishing because you're going tomorrow and it's exciting anyway. Um, you can just go and just tie up and put as many of those rigs on there. I think uh, I'm looking at that thing, right? It's got one, two, three, four. It's got eight spots where you can do eight different rigs. Um, I even put some dry fly rigs on there and have them set up. I wrap them around pretty tight, but I found that, you know, if you just kind of just pinch your line and just kind of run your hand on it, kind of warm it up, it straightens out really well and you don't have any issues. Um, so, yeah, that answered Terry's question about how to kind of build a Euro uh, leader and some of the tips um, around that. Um, let's see, what else? When you have off-color water, Matt Aldridge is asking, all, oh, sorry, I'm both doing your last name. What's your new first names? Matt, what's up, Matt? Uh, good to see you again, man. Uh, when you have off-color water, but fish are eating tiny nymphs and avoiding bigger streamers, do you just use brightly colored flies and stick to shallower water and seams? I think it kind of depends, Matt, on that. I think for, in my experience, I've had days like up on the Roaring Fork, for example, that water can be off color. Like, I mean, you get like maybe six to eight inches of, of, uh, of, of, of visibility into that, uh, in, 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 into that water. And yet I can still throw a size 24 purple betas or a, you know, white mids or something. And they, and they still hit it. They love it. They can, they can still see it. Some fish, I think have enough uh, um, exposure to that, you know, off color, on color water back and forth. Uh, like I think the place like the Roaring Fork, which is pretty naturally run stream up there, you know, it's not dammed up anywhere. Um, that I think that that makes it a, uh, the fish the fish don't seem to mind up there. Versus some places when, you know, they're used to clear water all the time and they get murky water. I think that tends to kind of shut them down. Um, I What I have found that works better for me is to just do a mix of both. So tie on a attractor pattern like a you know neon green like this little uh uh this this guy right over here i call my rocky flats worms because they're radioactive uh and uh there's the bright green and they just stand out no matter what what your you know what type of water clear it is i'll put that on like as a middle fly or something like that or the top fly and again that attracts the fish because the fish will see that and they move towards it they may look at them and go what the heck is that i don't want to eat that that's that's it that looks like it's got cancer and so they won't but uh, at the end, at the end of the day, they'll end up moving, then migrating towards that smaller nymph. The same thing, like when you do like a dry drop, or you do like a royal coachman up on the top. You might come up and look at that royal coachman, then decide to bail and end up beating your copper john down below, or something like that, right? So, um, that's typically what I do. But I, I don't, I haven't found that fish move to shallower water versus deeper water when it's uh, when it's murky. If the flows have come up, I think that pushes fish out of certain spots. But I think the water clear doesn't necessarily fish. Push, uh, yeah, push fit fish out of spots um, very often, at least in my experience. If anyone's got any other experience on that, just let me know because, uh, again, um, you know, there's only so often that I get out, and this is my experience. But if you guys have different experiences, be sure to let me know and uh, add those into the comments. Um, let's see. Uh, Terry says, nice beer mug. Thank you. You just reminded me. I'm going to have a drink. Cheers to anyone else out there having a beer along with me. Um, you're going to have to show that sliding three nymph rig with pictures later, Matt says. Yes, I will do that. Um, I'll do, I'll just post it up on the group later because I don't have anything around here that would work for that right now. I'm sitting in my office, but, um, I will do that later. <clears throat> Let's see here. What else we got? Is that, have you ever considered using the barrel swivel with a snap to be able to change your rigs quicker? Hey, Kevin. Yeah, so Kevin answer, asked the question, have you ever considered using a barrel swivel with a snap to be able to change your rigs quicker? Um, I'm not super uh, uh, familiar with barrel. I, I'm, I'm assuming you're just talking just normal swivel. I, I don't know much. About, I, I don't, then didn't do much on the whole terminal tackle when I grew up. So um, I did some bass fishing, but never any of the, of the swivel stuff. But if, if what I understand is, is right, I mean, I, I understand what the base of the swivel is. It's got the little hooks on, you know, so you can actually, you know, clip and unclip stuff pretty easily. I have thought about doing that, especially with nymphing. I really don't think the fish would care um, in most spots that I've fished, even, you know, tricky, you know, fickle tail waters. Um, I bet you'd be a good idea. I have not tried it yet. I have, the thought has crossed my mind several times. And so 
Um, it's probably just a matter of just making sure I have the right stuff um, and actually going out and just trying it. So uh, I'd love for you to try it if you want and then just kind of give me some feedback on it. Let me know how you did. Post it up on the group and let me know. Um, but I think that would probably be a pretty good solution to switching out flies as well pretty quickly um, instead of, you know, even just tying just one knot. The, the tippet ring for me, it's just one knot, so it's not a big deal. Um, I never have to tie more than one one knot. I'm going to switch out one fly, three flies. I don't have to do it if I'm going to do just two because then i got to do, you know, one for each one. So, yeah, um, good question, though. Um, what else we got here? Whoops, that's not what I want. Um, all right, Lee's having some wine. Congrats, man. Good for you, too. Uh, what are some other questions you guys got? Um, about 17 of you guys on here right now. Um, been doing about 35 minutes so far. Uh, how about we do some, wait, Terry just asked, how about using tube-tied midges to help with buoyancy in shallow water? Tube-tied meaning like that, like that standard like midge tubing, I'm assuming, right? That you can kind of wrap around that like people use for caddis and things like that that helps kind of wrap it around pretty good. I think those are... Uh, um, you know, those can work really well. I bet you those are actually probably fairly buoyant um, and would work pretty well for you too um, in, in that shallow water. I mean, from my experience, I mean, just the simple size 22, like mercury midge, I mean, it doesn't have a whole lot of weight to it anyway. And it's, it was 6X on, like, you know, it's, it, it, I don't know if you need to necessarily suspend at that point. Uh, foam back emergers, I do a lot of foam back emergers. So, um, you know, a little chocolate tied, you know, midge with a little bit of, you know, foam coming out the back really helps it kind of, you know, want to rise at least when it's kind of coming through the, the channel and kind of helps, helps keep it, you know, oriented correctly. So I think that those tend to do pretty well. Um, uh, Angelo said, how far do you place your flies apart on a nymph rig? Uh, it depends is the tough answer. Uh, typically, I'd say, let me see here. About that, so I'm probably talking 12 to 18 inches max. If it gets too far of, apart from itself, it's just, uh, it, especially when you're doing like a modern infantry, it's just hard to tell. It's hard to tell those strikes and hard, hard, hard to, uh, you know, the, the, hard to detect strikes ultimately when that happens. Um, I'll go down as short as maybe eight inches sometimes, um, either just because I've kind of you know retied a few times and I'm getting kind of narrow, or sometimes I'll keep it a little bit closer because. Um, I found like in, you know, in, in wintertime, for example, uh, when the fish do eat, um, they're pretty, uh, pretty tender about um, eating, eating those flies. So they don't just come up and crush it and then move. So you feel they're just, you know, they're sitting there, just mouths open, close, open, close. So, I mean, you don't really feel much of that fish eating. So the closer you can have everything connected, the less line open you can have out, uh, the better that's going to probably work for you. So wintertime, I do probably a little bit less, probably in that 10 inch, eight inch range, maybe at the, at the smallest. And then, um, you know, the closer they are, the more they're going to interact with each other, the further apart they are, the more naturally they're going to drift separate of each other. So that's kind of the give and the pull. That's the framework side of it. Farther apart, they move better, closer together, you can feel more. So it's a give and take, a pro and con to kind of what you need to do for your specific stream or wherever it is that you're fishing. Uh, let me know if that answers all your questions on that, but um, that's what I found to be successful. Okay, let's see. Um, oh, another one here from Michael. He says, when you use a split shot, are you, are they above your first fly or below your last fly? Oh, here we go. Okay, some good questions. My, Michael, I, I, I remember you asking this in the, uh, in the group or maybe in the trout bum group or something like that as well talking about where to place your split shot um, and the answer really is that you can actually place it anywhere on your rig um, it's just going to depending on the the if so so it, it's it, it changes things and again let's let's talk about the framework of it um, to learn the, the different pros and cons of why you put something in one spot or the other most people put it all above their flies because they want the that the the uh, a split shot to sink down to the bottom and then their flies to kind of hang out just slightly above so the split shot drags along the bottom and the flies are three, four inches above the bottom, kind of hanging out, bouncing along, doing their thing. So that way a fish is right here in that feeding lane, flies come along, it's just an easy hookup. Um, sometimes, if you like a two fly nymph rig, it can be helpful depending on the weight of those. If you're using all bead, beadless, no bead heads, um, excuse me, they'll float pretty, you know, if you put one, if you put it up top, they're gonna float a little bit higher up. Um, if you put it in the middle of the two flies, for example, they'll kind of float in a V. 
Um, it's just, again, where, where's the most weight on your rig? Is it the split shot or is the bead heads on your flies? And how are those going to, you know, wherever the heaviest part of your rig is, that's what's hitting the bottom. And everything that's less is going to be a little bit higher up and a little bit higher up. And it's going to float. And it's going to fall and float in that matter and drift along in a current in that sort of way. So personally, I usually put mine above my flies um, or right in between my flies if I have two flies that are light. So if I do two light flies, I'll do one in the middle. Um, and then there's sometimes two when I can tell the fish are suspended in slow water and I need to get them, I need to get at them and have the, the flies be coming along on the, in that same level, that same you know level that they're on. I'll actually tie off uh, a fly, I'll, I'll tie off some line just like I'm going to tie another fly, but instead I'll just tie the clinch knot there at the bottom and leave it empty and then actually put a split shot right and on top of that. So it's almost like a drop shot, like back, like in like bass, you know, back, bass days when you do like a, uh, I think it's called a Carolina rig, if I remember right, it'll hit there. No, no, it's, it's just a drop shot rig. Forget the Carolina thing. I don't know what I'm talking about that stuff. Uh, it's been years. Um, but you, your drop shot, so you have your weight down at the bottom so everything else sits up above. Um, it could be a very effective way because it looks like whatever your imitation is, is, is it's being suspended in the water. So that can make it kind of fun, a uh, fun way to kind of approach things as well as far as your uh, split shots. So hopefully that helps uh, uh, answer that question for you. Max, uh, <laughs> what beer? So yeah, if anyone is uh, local and wants to come over for a beer sometime, hit me up, uh, send me a private message or whatever you come over. I got a K-grader for my uh, Father's Day gift and I got the Shoots Fresh Squeezed IPA on tap and it is delicious. Uh, thanks, Angelo. Appreciate the, uh, uh, the thumbs up. Um, Rowdy Futon. Yeah, I just got that Futon later today. It's going to be three flipping hours to put together. It sucked. Um, would have rather been writing content for you guys, but, um, hey, now my dogs have somewhere to sleep when I work for the day. So, um, let's see, Lee. How's it going, Lee? Um, what combos are you using on your Nymph rig? Lately, I've been using a large, small combo i.e. like a patch rubber leg and a brassy. I got you. Like a heavy fly, light fly seems to work well. Um, yeah, this is good from from the experience that I've always that I've always read and learned from other people and then what I've always used and it's worked well for me is <clears throat> your heaviest fly should be your in a single in a single fly rig, it doesn't matter, just you know whatever your fly is, right? In a double fly rig, your heaviest fly should be at the bottom. And on a three fly rig, your heaviest fly should be in the middle. The reason for that is because um, if you put it at the bottom and it's a three fly rig, that that first fly up at the top is never going to get down that strike zone. But when you have, put it in the middle, it creates a little bit of a V. So it brings things down in that strike zone. Again, we always want to keep things as close to the bottom as we can typically when we're nymphing because fish are almost always hanging out on the bottom. Um, it's the safest place to be. It's the easiest place to be. Uh, a lot of reasons why fish are going to uh, be there for that reason. So. Um, with that being said, that's typically what I do. Um, I will experiment sometimes when I know that they're eating like an emerger pattern that I'll do like a heavier fly as the front fly and then a really light like foam back fly that I know is going to hit. I know my first fly is going to hit the bottom and then this one's going to be rising up and get, it's always going to be fighting to go to the surface. You know, so it's, it's a fly that almost float on its own, right? It's that type of buoyant, buoyancy to it, but this thing's just dragging it down. This thing just drags the bottom. I do like a jig style nymph on that. So it just drags the bottom, doesn't really get hung up. And then this thing's like just constantly trying to escape and emerge. And I think that the, the bouncing on the bottom makes it look like it's moving up and moving around the water. Man, I've had some great luck up on like uh, up in Fremont Canyon, uh, up in Wyoming a little bit, fishing some of the North Platte. Um, and then lots of different places, lots of different, you know, the tailwaters here in Colorado, 11 Mile, South Platte. Uh, you know, the dream stream, all, all those spots, um, have, have had really good success, uh, doing that. Um, when I know they're eating the mergers, when I see the fish are thinking about rising or they're working on rising, or I'm just seeing tails when the, uh, you know, when the rises are happening and not mouths. So yeah, um, keep posting up some questions. We've got a few more people coming in now. So welcome to everyone who's made it here. Uh, we got like a record of 23 at the moment, which is kind of, I don't know if that's good or not. I've never done this before. So, but this is fun nonetheless. Hope you guys are having a good time. Let's go ahead and do a giveaway. Let me think of a good question here. Um, what do we got? Let's see, on my shop, it's on the website. Let's ask a question, something 
It wouldn't be. I probably should have planned this out ahead of time, right? Um, do you guys want to do the flies or the hat? Comment below. Do you guys want to do the flies or the hat first? Uh, post up your comment. Let me know what you guys like. Um, I'll do that first. We should do a question on good trivia question. Hmm, now I'm blanking. Usually pretty good at this stuff. Let's see. Let's see if I can post. Can I post something here? Because usually, oh no, here I can do this. Here, hold on. I can do this. It's gonna happen, guys. It's gonna happen. I'm gonna pull up a picture of a river. We were doing this earlier today. It's on the uh, it's on the Facebook group already. Um, it was asking where the river is. So I want you guys to post where you guys think that river is, uh, the, the name of the river, the section of it, and whoever gets the closest will win the hat. Uh, let me see if I can get this picture up again so you guys can all see it. Um, let me see. Well, let me change sharing screens here. I was hoping to be able to do that. Show controls. Oh, that didn't do it. Well, this is great. All right, ask a carp question. Yeah, you would, Daryl. You would want to ask a carp question because the guy knows everything about carp. That doesn't count. That doesn't count. Uh, but we might have to do that. Okay, so if you guys go on to the, I'm going to comment on the link, on the photo link here. Everyone go and click on this link. It's the best that I could possibly do. And I'll give you guys a few tips. Hey, there we go. Posted the picture. It's over in the comments now. Um, so this spot was sweet. Uh, me and a friend went up here uh, last year sometime, uh, fished all over the river, and we came. This is a fork of a common river that f uh, flows right in plain daylight here for, for Colorado when you're driving up, up and around the, the uh, mountains. So it's along one of the major highways uh, that goes through the mountains, and it's pretty much it's kind of hidden in plain sight. Yeah, I gotta drive up along one of the passes to be able to find it, but it's a fork of one of these uh, of, of of that that river that's pretty commonly known. So comment down below, and we're gonna do uh, we're gonna give away the flies for this one. So free dozen flies, whoever gets the closest. Um, if you guys can answer, that's great. If not, that's good. Um, where are you guys from? I know if you guys are from Colorado, because this is definitely a river from Colorado, because that's where I fish most of the time. So if you guys don't know that, you're pretty much up a creek being able to, uh, pun intended, uh, up a creek being able to try to figure out where this is. So go ahead and post below in your comments. Let's see how that works. Anyone? Anyone? Looks like a bunch of duds at the moment. That's okay. Maybe these giveaways are not a good thing on Facebook Live. That's what we're learning. And maybe instead I should just give it away randomly to someone who has already commented on the thread. I'm going to do that. Just a random spin of the dice here. Um, random number generator. Between one and... Oh, how many comments are there? Don't say. I guess like thirty. Here we go. Number ten. Let's count through here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Larry. Uh, let's see. Larry Hagenbottom. If you're still on, man, you are the winner of the free flies. Um. Oh wow. Now we got a lot of comments. I don't know. There's like some weird lag going on, I guess. Sorry, I guess you guys were playing along. Sorry. This, you know, you're not talking back to me. I don't know. <coughs> um, if I click on it, it takes me away from the video. That's true. Hey, Joe, what's up, man? You're like in New York right now or something, I think, aren't you? Um, Bear Creek says, John, that is close. Um, it's a little bit clearer than that, though. Um, once the answer comes out, I think you'll get that. Um, somewhere off the pooter. Uh, that would be. It does look like an off the pooter, but that's not correct either. It won't show on mobile. Um, this is a bad, bad deal. Um, I'm just going to give it away to uh, somebody who commented and tried anyway. Um, 
if Larry is here, I already gave it to him. So if Larry is still here, um, send me a personal message and I'll get you those free and flies. If not, I'm going to pick a backup winner and I'll hook you up too. Um, we're going to do random number generator again, one through 15, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, Matt, Matt Nauta. I'm going to just post your name down here below, bro. You also win some free flies. And uh, there we go. You're the winner of free flies. Go ahead and send me a, uh, uh, ooh, Clear Creek. There we go. Oh, uh, Matt had it anyway, man. Clear Creek. That's pretty much correct. So it's actually the south fork of Clear Creek up Winella Pass. Um, that's pretty dang close. Hey, Michael. What's up, man? Uh, Michael just came on, too. How you doing? Um, yeah, so you're the winner. Uh, I was pretty pretty darn close, John. Uh, you were also close, man, with Upper Clear Creek, so congrats on that. Um, it's the South Fork of Clear Creek. So technically nobody was officially 100% right, but um, it's a pretty sweet little spot. Um, it's got some brook trout in it is about that all, all that I've been able to find up there, but um, it's got kind of an orangish kind of coffee teapot type of colored water, which is pretty cool because um, Clear Creek is so gin clear most of the time unless, you know, mining or runoff is happening. And it's a um, fun little spot. Um, you know, fish, uh, like most brook trout streams here in Colorado, when you get into the heavy brook trout, the fish are just pretty dumb. They're willing to eat a lot of different flies, especially if you skate them. That's a little tip that I've learned uh, brook trout fishing is um, if they won't take just a upstream presentation of a dry fly, to get up down, you know, get up in front of them, fish downstream them like you would a streamer, and almost swing it, skate it, hop it around, move it around. They just like movement. And when you get that dry fly hopping around and move it around, those fish just jump right up on it. So, um and I catch a lot of fish that way and uh, just a lot of fun. So um, coming up on about an hour here. I can't believe that time's passed so far. Time flies when you're drinking beer. Um, before we head out, let's do the hat giveaway as well. Um, go ahead and comment on what your favorite thing is about the catch and the hatch. How about that? Um, this is just going to be a random thing. What is it you guys appreciate the most about what we're doing? Um, what product, what fly do you like? Um, what memberships of ours do you like? Um, and then also, if, if you guys want to just comment as well, this also counts. If any comment, I'm just going to pick some of the com comments here and just pick a winner for the hat. Uh, another question I want to have is, you know, if we start doing more of these things, a couple of things that we were talking about um, doing, I'm trying to figure out how to hook up my DSLR, which is sitting right back there on that monstrous looking tripod. I use that for my fly time videos, and it gets up really close and really crisp, clean uh, shots. I'm trying to hook that up to Facebook Live so that we can sit down here tonight and say, hey, everyone's sitting around tying up some flies, you know, um, let me let me be able to do that as well. And you can see what I'm tying. We can tie along together. I can give some instruction, feedback, questions, all that sort of stuff. Could be kind of a fun way to do it. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about doing is actually doing, like, some screen share sessions um, a little bit about my fly tying or about uh, our, our memberships. Um, I know a lot of people have a lot of questions about the River Explorer and the Fly Explorer and the differences. And the Fly Explorer is a fly tying membership. The River Explorer is um, a Colorado-based membership that helps you find places to fish in Colorado. So those two different memberships, you have a lot of questions on kind of how to use it, um, go through some of the content, how the filters work, some different tricks and things you can do with it um, to really make the most out of it. I was just going to do just, you know, some screen shares and show you guys how to do that in the way that I do it. Um, so I thought that'd be kind of fun too um, here in the future. If you guys have other ideas that you'd like to see me do certain uh, Facebook live events on, let me know and we'll start trying this more. Um, hope you guys like this tonight. It's fun for me. I, you know, sit around and have a beer with you guys and um, get to connect with a few of you guys this way and hope you guys get to know me a little bit better. And hopefully what I shared tonight was helpful and useful to you guys. Um, if you like it, go ahead and give a little like or a, uh, you know, share or whatever you're supposed to do on these things. I'm not really sure, but yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for coming out. Um, where are these posts? I'm going to pick another person here in just a moment. Uh, we've got one sad face. That's okay. You know, can't make everybody happy, man. I'm sorry. Uh, there we go. We got some good likes coming in now. That's good. Um, what else? All right, I'm just going to pick a random person here again off of this random number generator between 1 and 45. Are we ready? Here we go for the hat giveaway. For those of you stuck around, you get to take advantage of this. 
generated number th uh, 32. I'm going to count backwards. 45 through 43. Hey, Angelo, number 32. All right, what's up, Angelo? You in the hat. Go ahead and just hit me up with a personal message, I think, or post on the Facebook page or uh, something. I'm not sure exactly. Just try a, a personal message here at the end of the uh, live session. Uh, I'll get your address, and I'll, I'll get the hat shipped out to here in just a few days. Um, send me a thing. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. All right, here we go. Good. Now we finally got some more comments coming in. Weird. Anyway, uh, you guys are saying Glenn would just like my help. No problem on that. Oh, that's been what you guys probably like, huh? Info and pictures, education, uh, the great intel. The stickers are rad too. Stickers are rad. Aren't they sweet? I like them. I'm, I've been a big fan. Probably the best thing I've designed so far from a design perspective. Matt likes the River Explorer. Um, Let's see, great material, comments of what everyone's doing on the river. Favorite thing about the catch and the hatch is how proactive you are with the group. Cool, on. hey, yeah, this is, I mean, this means of being more proactive, I guess, making the group more fun. So fly spores of juice, Max, you would say that. Uh, Max is actually helping write some of that fly spores. So a big shout out to him, he's doing an awesome job on it. Uh, guy's a really badass uh, guy down in Southwest Colorado. Spent some of his time uh, down in Tejas and then uh, comes up to Colorado a lot. And spends a lot of time up here too. So uh, he's a great guy because I want to connect with him. He's got a lot of good knowledge too and has been really a, a great asset to us as well. Um, let's see. Glad you guys seem like you guys like the, uh, the River Explorer a lot, um, which is sweet. Um, yeah, so hopefully you guys uh, keep liking what we're doing. Come up here on an hour. Probably going to call it a night here myself. I'm going to go tie a few more flies and watch some TV and just kind of chill. So. Hope you guys have a great weekend. Uh, get out there and do some fishing. Uh, a few fishing tips for anybody here in Colorado. Where I would go right now if I were you, this would be kind of a fun thing to share too. Um, two places I'd go if I just had the free time this week and go hit it up. I'd probably go hit the Dream Stream at night because the big brown trout are still in there and it's still fun to go check it out and uh, bring some friends, bring some beers, and bring some flies of all kinds. Eggs, streamers, San Juan worms, midges, betas, that sort of thing. And then uh, some sort of uh, visible strike indicator or tight line, like I've been talking about, and try that. You'll be amazed where those fish are hanging out in that river, especially during night. They're a lot more willing to eat. So you get some big fish that way and chase some kokanees too, and that's kind of a fun fun trip. Plus, there's lots of water to hit uh, there and back on your way, so it's worth checking out. The other spot I would hit, i got to check the flows again here real quick on it, but the Eagle River, when it hits 125 CFS, uh, anywhere from... Uh, I don't know, um, probably Beaver Creek all the way down to Edwards and all the way even down into kind of like the Wolcott sections. Um, that place fish is really good at 125 to 175 CFS. Um, the holes just seem to just produce very well. The the uh, the pace of the river, the foam, everything just comes together and just seems to work really well. So if I were you guys, I'd go fish the eagle. And I'd fish midges, betas, eggs, sand ones, and patch rubber lakes on those rivers as nymphs. And then if you see any dries, you know, probably going to be betas or midges that are hatching. So chase those down. And then I'd fish the dream stream. So that's probably where I go this weekend. Hopefully you guys get out. Um, have a great weekend, all you guys. Thanks for being a part of the first live session. And we'll try and do a little bit more of these here. Um, thanks for being a part of the Catch and the Hatch. Have a good one, guys.